March 23rd. Uh, it's Claire Community Development Meeting. I'm going to share my screen now to show the current agenda. You guys see it all right? Yep. All right, cool. Yeah. So a couple participants today, myself as always, Hank probably as always. Uh, then we have Ivan and uh, Aaron. So Ivan, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, sure. So my name is Ivan. I'm uh, Quay slash Claire support engineer working from EMEA currently in Ireland. Hopefully that will change sometime in the future. Um, thanks, for <laughs> thanks for inviting me to this meeting. No problem. And then a run. Hey, hello guys. Uh, my name is Arun. I'm based out of Bangalore, India. So I'm majorly working on uh, Red Hat uh, DevTools analytics uh, team. So we are actually building a software composition analysis platform. So mostly, uh, I, you guys will will see me uh, working on various integrations, uh, like integrating our SCA platform with the various tools like VS Code Extension, IntelliJ, and Clear. Yeah, that's what I do. Very cool. Cool, so a uh, couple things on the agenda today. I'm going to go over the enrichment specification, uh, moving to non-blocking Clear initialization, better integration testing, and then a question uh, that I kind of wanted to bring Yvonne into uh, because it's more of like what I would think it's like an operations concern. So I wanted to get your opinion on that. One of the reasons that I wanted to pull you in. And then Hank's going to go over some stuff around the changes to notify and JSON work. Uh, Yvonne uh, wants to talk a little bit about set OS and then Arun's going to introduce uh, their remote matching concepts that he added to Claire. Um, so first things first, the enrichment specification. Um, we have this repository, it's Quay Claire Enrichment Spec, and this is where we're housing the specification for enrichments. So in the initial design of Claire, we spent more time making sure the matching was accurate, um, and we made a somewhat conscious decision to ignore uh, metadata. Uh, as you know, there is some valuable use cases around uh, metadata for MBD and even extending the concept further, um, Red Hat container grades and other kind of scoring mechanisms to understand how vulnerable not just particular vulnerabilities are or the severity of particular vulnerabilities, but also how vulnerable or what's the grade of a container as a whole, right? So we want to hit those those two concepts. We want to bring those back into the equation. Um, so we've been working on this specification uh, called the Claire Enrichment Specification. Um, and I'm not going to dig through the entire thing, but I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of basically how this is going to work. So on the last step here, we're going to add an enrichments field into the vulnerability report. This is basically the schema you get that expresses which packages were found in the container and what vulnerabilities affect them. Now there will be an enrichments field um, with a string and an array of raw JSON objects. So when your client tooling goes and deserializes this, it can handle arbitrary schemas, right? Because we're just giving it a JSON raw message, basically like a blob of, of text. Um, now the string in the map, we encoded some information so that when the client sees these strings, they're going to use it as a hint to understand exactly what schema this metadata is in. Um, so if I'm a client and I'm looking at the vulnerability report, I'm going to go ahead and look at the enrichments field. I'm going to look at the string and then the string is going to give me, if it can, you know, if, if the schema data is available somewhere, it's going to give me a hint on that. So this allows us this kind of in-between where 
Claire doesn't really have to care about the schema of metadata, which I know, Hank, that was one of your big goals, but it can also inform the client of exactly how to interpret this metadata. Um, so the next obvious thing your brains are probably doing is like, okay, how does that key work, right? So inside uh, this topic, the MIME type usage, this defines exactly what that key looks like that the client's going to find um, on that enrichment data map. Um, I won't dig too much into it because it, you know, it's all here. You can basically read the specification, uh, but it provides a MIME type like, well, I guess it is a MIME type. We followed the same structure. Um, it provides a MIME type, which kind of expresses um, the container format. I'll get into that in a second. The enricher, which is the enrich, uh, the updater inside of Claire that actually put this data into the database, a schema. So now this is the important part. When the client is looking through uh, the enrichment data, if it finds a schema, that's great, right? It can go right out to the internet, grab the JSON schema file and understand the metadata. We have a mechanism placed in here that if the schema is not net hosted, um, there is no place to retrieve it from, you will be able to place a well-defined type in there, which really just means that you've created a type, you've documented it in our documentation, and that the client can go to the Claire Core docs and actually look up that type to understand how it works. And then if it decides to place no data uh, no schema data whatsoever, then the client, you know, is probably a dynamic language like Python, where it's just saying, hey, I don't even care about the shape of this data. I'm just going to forward it to a GUI or something like that. Um, so now you might be wondering about this portion right here. So this is a concept we have uh, where we defined container MIME types. And what this allows is basically you to wrap the MBD data with an associated vulnerability ID. And why we do this is because most of the time when you're looking at enrichment data, you want to map it to a vulnerability. So this just is that glue work, right? So if I'm a client and I see this uh, MIME type, then I know that the data is gonna be wrapped in a map and I'll be able to say vulnerability 18 has this metadata associated with it. So that's just how we link it together. Um, the rest of the spec is mostly just plumbing. Uh, the spec basically just piggybacks on all the already implemented updater work, or uh, updater content, uh, business logic and, and whatnot. We already do this, right? We do it with vulnerability data. So now we're just extending the concept uh, to enrichment data. Uh, we call it enrichment because we're enriching the vulnerability report with auxiliary data. So that's the specification. Uh, inside here, I've started working on the implementation. So this is the, you know, the nitty gritty. Uh, this will probably get parsed out into actual tickets in our ticketing system. Um, and this can be read over to understand literally the code changes we're going to make. To, to make this uh, specification work. This is still in a little bit of review. I think we're getting it into a pretty good place, um, but I do uh, suggest that anyone that's interested in, you know, the current state uh, that we do not have, well, that we have missing severities uh, for particular vulnerabilities, if you're interested in that and why that is and how we're going to fix that, then you'll probably want to go and actually take a look at this Claire enrichment spec. This is slated for Quay 3.6. Uh, it might be, it will, I'm assuming it'll be upstream before then. Um, but yeah, so that's the enrichment spec. Just keep it in mind, it's, it's currently being developed uh, and it's the whole purpose is to bring back metadata into Claire's results. Cool, so let me get back to the agenda. So the move to non-blocking Claire initialization. Um, currently in Claire v4, the stable release, the, the releases we ship with Quay, the matcher completely blocks until everything is updated, uh, or at least we run a full 
update interval. So obviously there's some downsides to that, right? Uh, like we blocked everything. We didn't even return uh, like health checks, uh, the entire thing locked up. So we just changed that concept. I think after spinning around with it uh, and some group discussion, we're moving to uh, the stance where Claire does not block, but Claire will return a particular HTTP code if it's not initialized. So <laughs> the history here and the, and the way we even got here is that there's been a lot of tickets around bad responses in Claire v2. Um, responses where the database isn't initialized, so it says, hey, everything's okay, uh, but it, it wasn't. There was just no data in the database yet. So that was one of the first tickets we got. And Yvonne, I'm sure you're aware of that issue too, because it's just an ongoing, it was an ongoing thing about how to actually do this correctly. So where we landed was, um, it won't block, so you can actually use the service and we're going to return you an HTTP code that a client can basically ask for vulnerability reports until they get a 200. Now, if your client, you know, doesn't really care that much about accuracy, they can take what they, they can take what they get. Because while we're updating, we'll still return vulnerability reports. They're just not complete data. So now you have the you have the option. You can either take what you get real fast, knowing that you might request it a little bit later, or you can have the client sit there and wait for a 200 and then return the vulnerability report. So that's kind of how we're approaching that problem, um, all in the effort of informing the client that, hey, you know, these results might not be completely correct. We haven't finished initializing the database yet. Um, so Hank, you worked a little bit on that. Did I get that mostly correct? Uh, mostly. Um, we still won't return partial results. Um, so that's, that's not correct, but we will I'd start serving API requests right away will just like sort of swallow your request and return a non 200 return. And then um, I think as part of this effort for the next release, we'll probably add an explicit readiness probe at some point. Cool, cool. Yeah, so so we won't give partial vulnerability reports. We'll only return that. HTTP. What is that HTTP status too? Um, I set it to be 202 accepted. Gotcha. Yeah. Which is, Except. yeah, it's like, hey, you made a request and I know it's a good request. Not going to do anything with it though. Okay. All right. Because, that's cool. Uh, yeah. What's, what's happening there? Gotcha. Yeah. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the, what's the, ups, what's the upside of this? I mean, the client still will not get any, uh, any vulnerability data back. So, it doesn't make so any the, difference between what is going on now and what will be going on in the future, functionality-wise. The upside is um, any sort of monitoring system that's trying to care about whether the um, API port is like up and accepting traffic can now do that because we'll start serving traffic immediately and not wait for an entire uh, update or loop to run. Yeah, I think I think the premise really came from the fact that right now we have the, the TNG operator. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Hank, but the TNG operator now like just blocks until Claire is available. And Claire doesn't become available until we run what could be a rather long update interval. So, we wanted to skate around that problem, but also be able to tell clients like, hey, these re this request isn't valid yet. We haven't completely initialized everything. Especially this is a problem where you're running in combo mode, right? Because it would block the other services from starting as well. So is yeah. that correct, Tank? Like you wouldn't even be able to index. Yeah, if, it, would, yeah. it would just, yeah. It yeah, wouldn't even so. start uh, the HTTP server until everything was good. So yeah. yeah, this yeah this makes it so it actually you can do at least some useful work with it as soon as possible. 
Yeah. So the T the TNG operator actually blocks it because the validation will not go through until Claire Claire responds with something. Yeah. yeah. That that's why that's why it's blocking it's blocking the, the whole deployment. That can be circumvented by just saying, hey, don't validate. Uh, and I'm also thinking that um, maybe health checks should not be connected to um, to the fact that Claire does or doesn't serve traffic. Maybe check health pod health on a different in a different way. I yeah, don't know. I mean, I think that's just that's just um, sort of an artifact of way the actual like Kubernetes manifest is written right now, uh, because like we do serve a health check on a different, um, in a different way that comes up immediately. Uh, yeah. But it's just not being like looked at. Yeah, but even so before your changes, that introspection server was blocked, right? Or? No. Oh, I thought it was, okay, Never mind. No, that spun up immediately. Gotcha. But it, it's more so that like, I think uh, not to like, uh, I don't know, not to talk shit, but like I, I told Alec like what the differences were and then he said, yeah, I want to, I really want to look at serving API responses. But this can yeah. also be, I mean, I'm thinking that if we have a health check, health port 8089 for overall Claire health, we can actually implement something similar. I mean, you can uh, implement something similar as Quay does. Uh, Quay returns a JSON that says these components are alive, these components are not alive. So if the health point actually returns something like that, it can be interpreted and then Quay and any other um, uh, registry that is hooked up to Claire can actually know when to start sending data across. And that wouldn't block the validator either because yeah, we would see that Claire is up, that's fine. So Quay can continue bootstrapping but we won't send any manifest to it until the health point says, hey, we are now available because the database is updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's, I mean, I definitely want to get it. I want to get it sort of like the um, Kubernetes API health endpoints that does something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we just haven't, got around to it, needed it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have all the plumbing set up to basically inject, you know, a health check of arbitrary complexity. We just haven't been a uh, you know, we just haven't gotten around to actually writing that health check of arbitrary complexity. So, <laughs> it's all there. It can be applied. Um, but I'm not exactly I'm not sure if the concept we have of a non-blocking start and your health check concerns are, um, you know, mutually exclusive. I think they basically live together. Yeah, they're definitely not. This is this is like a, a first step towards having it work that way. Cool. But yeah, I think, I mean, I think we all have, we definitely have the plans to get there. Uh, I do know Quay's, Quay's health check is actually pretty nice. So I think we, we do use that as inspiration. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with you. It'll get granular as we move on. Cool. Well, that's just a heads up to, you know, watch that because it does change the behavior of Claire a little bit. If you have any kind of like mechanisms that are sitting there assuming that it will block, it won't no longer. So you'll have to actually check. Um, okay. Better integration testing. So right now we have a pretty poor testing story. Um, we don't really, we build via tests, but we don't really do much in terms of verifying uh, and especially comparing to previous builds. So I was thinking about ways to actually attack this problem. Um, 
And what first comes to mind, the simplest thing is that we have a local development environment and GitHub Actions allows for Docker Compose, I think. I mean, I have to confirm that. But it's possible that we just run the local development environment inside GitHub Actions. Um, and then basically have some kind of comparison logic. Hank, we talked a little bit about creating a testing harness around this, right? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So that would basically just be like um, an executable that knows that the local development environment is up, right? Uh, more or less, yeah. And then we'd have to see the thing I'm thinking of. Go on. Yeah, I think the like the actual machinery to spin up of everything we support and configure it to talk to each other isn't, I don't know, super interesting. It's more yeah. so like what does what does it look like? What are the what are the actual tests we want to run? Because right now it's uh, it's pretty fuzzy as to like what um a successful run looks like like uh it's very easy for a human to classify mm -hmm. whether this uh is okay or not and uh, so, not very easy for a computer so one of the things i was thinking about is that you know somewhere we cache so the actual testing system right like let's say we started it tomorrow right it has no data uh just run with me here like just conceptualize this with me because let's say we started it tomorrow it gens vulnerability reports and uh index reports it caches those reports somewhere now the next time we run it it checks against the last build to confirm that things look the same so the onus is on us to make sure that first run is correct at least correct as can be right there could still be bugs but that's just you know what are you going to do we have to identify those in another way Com pure comparison isn't going to be enough but this is just i'm trying to scope this small to begin with which would just be like hey this thing looks different from the old one is something wrong so if we you know create this timeline uh where we start tests on one day we basically seed an index report and a vulnerability report and then then every maybe we'll have to figure out when it actually runs merges or releases or whenever it looks at the previous one and does a comparison and then if it doesn't look right we need some kind of tooling in github that says you know it's not right on purpose or it's not right fail this basically which i haven't really conceptualized either because i'm not sure if there's a user input steps in GitHub Actions yet. Yeah. But did that sound like a general first step towards better testing? Yeah, I think I think that would be I think that would be okay. We'll probably need to come up with like a I don't know, like I guess our our uh, test harness will have the comparison function. Yeah, exactly. I don't think we'll be able to just like bite compare things absolutely not. Um, no. yeah so we'll have to write whatever that equality function is but that sounds good i think we can have that run we might want to split it in half and have it think about like uh one part runs against one set of like images yeah one set of uh containers that we pushed up to like our own quay a uh, repository mm -hmm. and have to like handle regressions and then some that pull against live containers to handle uh, like changes that are actually happening. If that makes sense. Definitely live containers uh, to evaluate any new bugs basically. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Because we'll we'll be very, you know, we'll know exactly uh, the differences in the managed containers. But then there's a little bit, uh, you know, whenever we go with live containers, there's a little bit of concern, but it is what it is. I mean, 
if we pick containers that don't shuffle their tags around too much or that are pretty dependable, it, it should work fine. But I, I do yeah, see we can set up cron jobs to pull things locally so that it doesn't like break CI. Yeah, and yeah, update that makes them. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think you know with the with this strategy, I think there's a lot of room with testing Claire, especially because you know Claire's a little a little complex to test because it does all that deferment of work. So that becomes a pain because you know as as soon as you make one index, you're caching. So it gets a little bit. Yeah, tough. we might want to implement all of the cache busting flags that we. I keep talking about every so often. On a tangent, well, not so much of a tangent, but I was thinking like, what if we just literally instrument out an API that shows you indexed and also just has a delete, like make it a little bit simpler. Yeah, we could do that. I think this is the second, this is the second thing that's come up. That makes me a little wary that someone might want that to be behind mm -hmm. uh, an Aussie system. Yeah. Do we do we punt off though? I mean, we have JWT built in, so we but have that's, some. Mechanism. That's just um, authentication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not saying that's hey, just, this you can plan. talk to the API at all, not. You can talk to the API and you're allowed or disallowed from doing some things. I mean, we could just start checking claims, you know, instead of just verifying in the JWTs if we did want to go down that route. But it's a we little could, bit more of a but then we need time. to like be able to specify multiple ones and multiple ones mean it like with different power levels and I don't know. I think if we do this, we should just shove it on the uh, debugging on the introspection port to start with. Okay. Because that way, like, you have to do shenanigans on the control plane to be able to talk to it at all. Okay. Which is easy enough for development. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, we're we're splintering a little bit, but I'll make that another topic soon, which is like, how do we start busting the indexer caches so we can actually do things repetitively? Because it's just a pain in the ass to test right now without that, you know, like I just dump the database and start the database and dump the database and start the database. And sometimes yep. I'll run truncate commands and queries that I then lose because I don't keep them around. So. Okay, we'll make that as a agenda topic coming up. But this is pretty good. I think I'll start at least conceptualizing how to go about those comparisons. Um, cool. So now a question that I wanted to pull in Yvonne for as well, um, and a question that me and Hank, you know, it came up on a PR and we were both like, I don't know. So should Claire fail startup if introspection fails? So if we can't connect to, uh, syncs for event data, or for some reason we can't set up Prometheus, which is probably not going to happen since it's all local, but whatever it might happen, should Claire fail totally? And we, or should it continue running and there'll be no metrics? Um, I'm not exactly sure because, you know, like running in a production environment without metrics, we probably want to not do that, I would assume, but I'm not sure. I mean, you might have a little bit more experience you know, just dealing with the running of systems. <clears throat> well, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I think that the primary reason why someone runs Claire is to get their uh, containers scanned and this, mm -hmm. These scan, uh, scans should be complete, or at least they should be um, complete as they could be. Mm -hmm. So if if introspection fails in the sense of sources are not available and updaters cannot function, then Claire should definitely report this in one way or another. Um, I'm not so sure about Prometheus. I mean. Uh, we haven't had any questions about 
Prometheus metrics that are exposed by Claire yet, um, because the the thing is rather new. Yeah. So there is no there is no data <laughs> that I can I can share. Yeah, um, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, I guess that. for for context, when we talk about introspection, we're talking about the second HTTP server that it spins up that serves like um, profiling information, health checks, and metrics information. Um, well, definitely, if we should definitely need health checks. If if we are using them, then Mm. then they de definitely should be there. So yeah, yeah. I mean, if I health guess my checks fail is, in, and for any reason, Claire should not function. Yeah, I guess my thinking is if you're actually paying attention to the health checks, uh, you'll be unable to read them and the exactly. container will get owned. So because well, currently, currently it it crashes. Like we'll just we'll just pull everything down, right? Um. In some in some cases, for some reasons. Oh, for yeah, just the Jaeger stuff, because yeah, yeah. But you do make a good point. I mean, it's not well. One, yes, if you can't get the health checks, the system's going to pull it down anyway. But two, there's not like a clear Boolean like introspection is on or off. I mean, there is on. No, there's not because we can configure aspects of introspection. Yeah. I mean, so. for, I guess, for historical curiosity, the reason why I, like, implemented it as everything keeps chugging along if this doesn't come up is because I was, like, running a bunch of these locally and was too lazy to change, like, change two port numbers in a bunch of configs and didn't care. So they just, like, tried to... Tried to open the socket and failed and kept running because that was easy. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, this this whole discussion with introspection, uh, it's um, it connects to the to the second point we had the discussion we had about non-blocking Claire initialization. So um, if I'm if if the health point if the health checker is returning a JSON or something similar like an object that says these uh, components of Claire are functioning, these components are not yet functioning, uh, and we go to, towards that approach, mm -hmm. then without the introspection being online, we cannot know what other components are actually alive or not. So we must assume that something went ter ter terribly wrong and we should just drop everything and restart. In my opinion, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I guess this is sort of a question of how much uh, misconfiguration do we want to tolerate? And I guess if you frame it like that, my answer is less. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I, I think that's a good point too. Uh, it seems like you know I've made a note here that. An emphasis on a good health check is going to kind of clear the fog on a lot of these questions that we have because it does it will provide some granular details about what's actually working and what's not. Yeah. But at that point, we can make a more educated decision about you know does the client pull it down for that reason? It maybe moves the responsibility of what's acceptable to not on us. Uh, in in my opinion, uh, we we could tolerate. Uh, Prometheus going down. Um, I don't see it as a highly critical component. Metrics can 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 be like restored um, at any point. But if the introspection itself, like the health checker, is down, then then no, player needs to be restarted. Yeah, and to Hank's point, it's. It again, it's it's a little bit of a amb ambiguous statement because if you're watching the health checks and they don't go up, then it's going to tear it down anyway. So do we tear it down, or do we just let the infrastructure do what it should do with health checks? 
Yeah, because I mean, yeah, we're talking about the thing that serves the health check is if if that fails to come up, should we just keep plugging ahead or not? Yeah, because if it fails to come up, then, you know, the infrastructure that's checking the health check should tear that thing down. But do we rely on that, you know? Well, it depends on how how um, how frequent you actually check the health check. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, it should be like if it's if it's for a minute, you you can get a lot of stuff done in a minute, <laughs> and it also has a threshold. So it, if if the threshold is, for example, five. Uh, continuous errors and you have a flaky uh, instance or a flaky um, service that is going up and down constantly, then um, you might miss things. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting a little tight here. So, Hank, you want to do the notifier JSON? Oh, sure. Um, so I, at one point, a week ago, two weeks ago now, uh, was working on the notifier. Um, we think we need some, like, structural changes to the notifier. Um, because the way the way it works now is it um, sees an update, like takes that one update, processes everything in one node's memory, um, and then sends it off to be delivered. Um, so that probably, be, or uh, yeah, because of like the way the Red Hat um, Container databases camera. are structured when they yes. show up for the first time they might be quite large um and they're showing up they can show up at any time it's not like we can just whitelist new ones um so so we need to like split that into a i don't know checkpointing work model uh that gets spread across everything and um, I both so I started on the design the, of that a little bit, uh, but before that I did some efficiency work, which included um, reworking how we handle JSON. Um, so now we should be doing streaming JSON serialization everywhere in Claire, uh, which just uses less memory and should generally just be strictly better. So when I'm working in uh, the HTTP layer now, are there changes I need to consider? Do I have to use the codec package now that you added? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's just an internal package as the functions for you and just use those and they'll do the right thing and pool everything and yeah, it'll be nice. There's less memory usage. Cool. So basically just look at the, uh, the functions in the codec package. That's all I need to care about when I'm just, you know, munging. Yeah, when JSON. you're reading and writing JSON, just use those. Okay. Uh, like I, uh, the PR that pulled them in changed all the handlers to use cool. those those packages. So just read a handler, make it look like that. It, yeah, yeah. There's examples. It will get all the benefits. Um, there's some movement in the Go standard library to okay. implement a streaming JSON uh, kind of scheme, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a ways off. So we're going to continue using this third-party package that does it for now. Cool. All right, that's good to know, yeah, because I know there were some changes there, so sounds like there's plenty of examples, so that's good. Okay, Ivan. Yeah, so um, this is this is quite a huge issue for 
for a bunch of our uh, a bunch of our clients who are uh, still using CentOS images and uh, not only it's a pro it's is a problem for images that they are building on CentOS but there are also a bunch of other images like uh, open source projects that used and are using CentOS as base images. Currently, Claire V4 does not uh, scan uh, CentOS uh, images or images based on CentOS, uh, which is, as I said, a problem. It also breaks functionality because Claire V2 did have this functionality and Claire V4 doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand that uh, Claire V4 has a completely different um, infrastructure and is built differently and it also um, cans differently, uh, it uses different sources. Um, and uh, I understand that because of that, the functionality of the new Claire is different than the old Claire, but I really think that we should do something about enabling CentOS scanning at least until CentOS is alive, um, which it still is. Uh, and also, uh, if we don't, if we say that CentOS cannot be scanned, then the, we should move it to the unsupported, uh, completely unsupported um, list of operating systems. Currently, the the problem is that when you when you push an image to of, that is based on on CentOS, either seven or eight to to Quay, and it's being scanned. The results that Claire uh, sends back is passed, and it doesn't show any vulnerabilities. And we had a case uh, where a client pushed the same image to uh, Quay IO and their uh, Quay local. And Quayio returned a bunch of vulnerabilities, while their local Quay did not. And there was a question why these why these things are different, like so different. Yes. Yeah, so my thoughts on this right now is that I would love to support CentOS. Um, I think whether we can do that reliably needs. Um, a research spike. I know that in Claire v2 there were quite a few issues um, with package alignment around matching. I personally have not done any research into that. So I need to do that research or talk to an individual who knows about CentOS packaging with uh, RHEL and whether they are completely compatible, right? So if I'm searching through an RPM database on CentOS, Will those version, will those package names and versions match up directly with vulnerabilities in in the RHEL ecosystem? I don't know that. I don't know unless you have joined too. I'm not exactly sure if you know this or have details about that. Um, no, I only um, focused on Red Hat uh, things. Yeah. So like CentOS yeah. was completely out of my scope. Yeah, that's totally cool. Um, but we do yeah, need to as do. Far as, as far as I know, that's not the case. It's usually the case, being how uh, CentOS, I don't know, Classic, I guess, 8, is a downstream of RHEL. It's usually the same, but not always, mm -hmm. um, which is like part of the ambiguity that we wanted to avoid by using security. Uh, databases provided by the distribution uh, publishers, and I—I I mean, I—I uh, don't think this is going to be satisfied, or I think this is only going to get worse with Stream, where that's now an upstream of RHEL, so the RHEL data is even less. Um, even less relevant to the CentOS packages. Yeah. And if they, and I mean, if they don't maintain a security database or a stable distro, 
I highly doubt they'll maintain a security database for a rolling release distro. Yeah, but now to your other point as well. Um, I do think that we need some kind of mechanism that says this container is not supported, uh, especially with Quay. Doing that, uh, we're going to need to take a look about uh, take a look on where is the appropriate place to kind of place that business logic in. Um, I can kind of wing some out there, uh, but we're kind of short on time. But we can definitely make that a conversation point for the next community development meeting. And if it's priority for you, we'll make it a conversation point right now in the GitHub discussions. Um, but I do agree with you, like bare minimum, we should be telling the client like, hey, we don't support this container. You'll have to proceed at your own caution. We shouldn't just I mean, be in a sense we do, we don't return a thing that says, hey, this is, we know that this is a CentOS image and we didn't find anything. We return, we don't know what to make of this. As in, we return nothing. Yeah, but nothing is also what we return when there's no issues. No, no, no. We still return like, hey, we discovered this distribution. And like True. there. True. I don't know True. how how Quay does it with Fedora and uh, every other distribution that is not uh, supported. But if you if you upload a Fedora, image or Arch Linux image, it will show as unsupported. No, you make a great point, Hank. We might be able to shortcut most of the work and just say, hey, if we didn't find a distribution, this container is not supported. We'll have to play around with that idea, but you are right. We we didn't detect anything, so. Yeah, I mean, that's a distribution layer or a client this, layer thing, but yeah. 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 So that's interesting. Yeah, we can definitely play around with that. I mean, it's, it would be a tiny Quay PR that's just like, hey, if you don't see a distribution, say that this container is not supported. The only thing that, you know, does it run, does it run into issues where, you know, the user knows it's like a, a Fedora container, but we just didn't identify it correctly. Like there's an OS release file missing, or is that okay? If the OS file is missing currently, then it will still show as unsupported. It, that would be the case, yeah, if, if we went that route, so. Um, that's that's the deal with Quay.io. Okay, okay, so that, I mean, that would be feature parity. So yeah, that's a good point. Okay, we can definitely take a look, at bare minimum, we can take a look at that and maybe approach the problem uh, with just a quick Quay PR um, to at least, you know, appease and, that. But we'll have to do a little bit more research on on the state of CentOS. Yeah, I, I shared a link to, uh, to Aqua Securities Trivi, which is used mm -hmm. for Harbor. I mean, Harbor uses it now because Claire is being deprecated by Harbor. Um, and it has uh, it does support CentOS completely, and it also supports distro-less containers. So we yeah. might we might check that out as well, because we've had questions about distro-less containers. Yeah, I think I mean it's a small blip, but distro-less is is on our radar. It's got brought up, and I did do some like early analysis, and it seemed possible. I don't think it's a big hurdle. Uh, we'll just have to take. A relook at it, but I do agree. I think that's a hot topic, and I don't think it's really that hard for us to support at this time. So we'll put that on the radar. Um, so let me. S okay. Um, I'll type up some notes. A run. If you want to go over remote matcher, uh, Ivan, are you are you good with all that? Yep. Okay. I'll type up some notes. A run. You can just start. Yeah, sure. Uh, shall I take the screen? I have yeah, a little presentation. Definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. I'll stop. That's awesome. Okay, hope you guys can see my screen. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, I'll give a brief uh, introduction about the remote matcher. 
anyways it's a very small feature it's not a big deal so, so this high level architecture of clear it's not really for you guys it's for the one who is uh, going to be, <laughs> look at the recording so, so basically the clear uh, mainly consists of two parts libindex and libvar uh, the libindex uh, is responsible for uh, extracting the package and version from the container layer and it produces the index report and uh, the index report is fed into the libvar which basically consists of two major parts matcher and updater so the updater fetches the uh, advisories from various publicly known sources and populates the database and matcher uh, basically matches the index report with the uh, uh, database and produces a vulnerability report so yeah so this is how a clear look like with the remote matcher basically the remote matcher uh, combines the functionality of matcher and updater and it's a kind of a parallel implementation it bypasses the uh, actual matcher and updater uh, uh, from the uh, lib world uh, yeah so it doesn't actually replace it's a kind of an add on to the existing matcher infrastructure uh, yeah so basically the the purpose of the remote matcher uh, is to talk to an external uh, service from where uh, uh, you can get the vulnerability uh, matching done uh, uh, the main purpose of this is to uh, uh, leverage uh, for example like uh, the security vendor api uh, where you may not get the complete database uh, to populate into your local database but uh, you can make use of the security vendor uh, apis and do the matching and also uh, you can use it for the use cases like where your org has a set of uh, uh, packages right i mean uh, the allow list packages and you want to check the container against that allow list and if you don't want to ship anything which is not in the allow list so you can make use of uh, the remote matcher for all these uh, kind of use cases and okay so why do we want to do this uh, specifically for uh, the work which we are trying to do so uh, before getting into the nitty gritty like uh, i just want to give some introduction about our uh, platform uh, which uh, we have in red hat as part of dev tools team so the team name is uh, red hat uh, code ready dependency analytics we usually build uh, the software composition analysis platform which is focusing mainly on the security analysis uh, dependency analysis and license analysis uh, and we have basically it's a hosted platform uh, it is hosted in uh, openshift uh, osd and it exposes a set of uh, restful endpoints to do uh, perform all this analysis listed over here uh, also we have uh, various integrations in place uh, like uh, vs code intellij where you'll get uh, in id uh, security analysis experience so we can do all uh, all the security analysis without leaving your ide uh and also like currently we are focusing on integrating our platform with clear uh so that you can uh, uh i mean you can do the same uh, with the container scanning as well uh so right now our uh, our platform supports uh, four ecosystem uh, python node uh, maven and go so we support a vulnerability analysis for all these uh, uh, repositories and uh, the main uh, point here is that uh, uh, our data vulnerability data partner is Snyk. Uh, most of you folks already would have heard about Snyk, and they provide a very uh, reliable and good uh, vulnerability database. It's a high-level overview about our platform, and I can skip this. Okay, so the main reason for building this uh, remote matcher uh, implementation is that. Uh, our security data partner is not allowing us to share the database uh, to the clear uh, actually they want uh, the data to be served uh, through our layer uh, through our hosted layer so that's why uh, uh, we, we built this uh, remote matcher uh, concept uh, with the help of Luis. yeah so the next one yeah so this one is like Suppose if you are a VS Code fan, probably if you want to see what we are really doing, you can just download this extension and give it a try. Uh, it got a pretty good download. Yeah. So yeah, so this is what finally we are trying to realize. Like as I said, uh, 
uh, we want to make use of the hosted API, which we are exposing uh, from the Clare. Uh, so basically, uh, we want to uh, propagate all this information to the OpenShift uh, Dev Console uh, through various layers. So from from the remote matcher, it will uh, go to the Clare. Uh, then from Clare, it will go to the Quay, and from Quay CSO through a CRD, it will reach to the uh, OpenShift Dev uh, Dev Console. Uh, where the developers can see all the uh, vulnerabilities associated with their container image, which is deployed into the cluster. So this is a pretty long path, but yeah, it, it, it is working. Yeah, that's what we are really trying to achieve with this remote mature concept. Yep, that's it, folks. Very cool. So um, will we eventually see language support in Claire um, with extended to that supported language support list that you had. Um, is that the overall goal? Uh, because right now I know that you have something in flight for Java, but is your expectation to continue the same path to get Python node, you know, go uh, into the remote matching facilities in Claire? Yep, yep, definitely Luis. So as you, as you said, like uh, currently the Maven support is uh, in flight. Uh, so basically the indexer part of the Maven is done. It's kind of in the uh, testing phase. Uh, anyways, like the remote matcher uh, so, uh, out of box supports uh, all four ecosystem mentioned over here. Uh, the only thing is like uh, we need to take care of the indexing part. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, that'll be a great addition. There's a little bit of caveats with remote matching and notifications. I don't, I don't think we have a great way to bridge them together because notifications requires us to understand when uh, databases have been updated. And because you have a remote database here, we don't have that concept, but we might want to spend some time uh, in the future circling around whether we can get that data uh, somehow. Maybe we can bridge the system to work. Obviously, when we first designed notifications, we didn't have remote security databases in mind, we assumed that we would always be holding the data and understand, you know, when the updaters go and grab new vulnerability databases. But, uh, you know, given enough brain power, we might be able to bridge the notification systems into the remote matching concept. Uh, it just needs to be sat down with. But, I mean, it's great to see that in some way, shape, or form, we're going to have a pretty robust language support moving forward. Yep, sure, sure. And another Very caveat cool. is that uh, currently uh, uh, the integration work which I did only supports the uh, connected environment. Uh, for the air gapped environment, uh, we still don't have a, a working solution uh, right now. Uh, we are focusing that uh, as well. Yeah, and as far as I understand, the like there's not a way to do that, right? For AirGap, because <laughs> your partnership with SNCC says you can't maintain this data, right? Uh, no, actually, uh, the contract is something like we can uh, serve the data uh, through okay. our layer. Yeah, we can't uh, deliver the data as a whole, or we can uh, serve the partial data <laughs> through our layer. So that's the call. Probably we can think of having a, some like a component which can go into the uh, disconnected environment uh, like that can act like an, uh, a remote matcher. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that was an awesome presentation. I, I appreciate that. Cool. So that's, we're about at the end of the agenda. Um, Brad, I see that you have joined. Um, if you guys don't mind uh, waiting another couple of minutes, Brad, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning. Um, yeah, hi, I am, I don't know if my video is working, there we go. Uh, so yeah, I'm Brad um, from AWS ECR team. Uh, we are currently using, for our image scanning solution, we're currently using Clare V2, um, and we are looking at migrating to Clare V4. Um, yeah, just trying to get a, a feel for the roadmap and what's going on and what's, what's coming down the pipeline. Very cool. Yeah, we recorded this session, um, so you'll be able to play back anything. We're actually at the end of it now. Um, but did you have anything you wanted to bring up specifically 
or um, you know, will we just wait till the next agenda? Or I am curious about poking you because I don't know much about how AWS is using it uh, in, in your back end. And I think there's some good, really good conversation points around there, especially with Claire before, but um, I don't have anything particular, but I'm curious about, you know, just with your experience so far, uh, do you have any comments or concerns? Uh, sorry, no, I think my video cut out there. Uh, nothing nothing particular at the, the moment, just uh, cool. like I said, trying to get a feel and I'm sure things will come up and I'll bring them up when they do. Awesome. Well, it's great to meet you. Uh, I look forward to Thanks. hearing from you more. So yeah, we'll wrap this one up. Um, I'll, I'll drop the video in the agenda so you can catch up on anything that you missed, but I appreciate it. It was a great presentation by everyone. Thanks.